that um, there should be a little red dot that's going to show up here on your um, menu that's that's letting you know that we are recording and uh, so we'll be recording until the presentation is over this evening again for for future use and i'd like to introduce our speaker for the evening our speaker for the evening is uh, ricky thompson ricky is a county extension agent for agriculture and natural resources in nacogdoches county which is nacogdoches texas he judges lots of places in texas and other states he judges swine at use shows and other species of livestock as well ricky has raised pigs and been been involved with swine showing for many years he's been a county agent for 25 years and he has got a lot of experience and some really good information to share with y'all this evening uh, Y'all should have received a copy of his presentation, kind of a handout that you um, can either print out or maybe look at later on your computer. And with that, I'm going to turn my video off for a while and I'm going to turn it over uh, to Mr. Thompson. Thank you, Ricky. <clears throat> All right. Hey, uh, glad to be with everyone this afternoon and um, I will um, see if I can get this pulled up where um everybody can see it you should be able to um see my presentation is that uh correct not yet not yet oh yet. okay i need to share my slide share your screen okay hang on one second I'm going to um, take off my mic. How about now? Yes, I can see your I can see your slide. Okay, perfect, 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 good deal. Well, um, can everyone hear? I uh, assume everyone can hear me fine now. And um, as Brian said, uh, my name is Ricky Thompson. Uh, certainly glad to um, be presenting this presentation uh, to you all this afternoon. I hope there's something here that will um, help you or encourage you on your next outing with the show pig. And um, it's been a it's been a long time for me and something that I have enjoyed and uh, my family have enjoyed as well. And uh, doing these presentations um, is something that I enjoy because I feel like it's something that I can give back through all of the success that that we've had. And um, there's I'm not for sure what level uh, everybody's at, but I'm going to just go from A to Z. And um, if there's something that seems kind of uh, 101 to you, then overlook that and just know that there's somebody out there that that may need that information. But, um, you know, I, I can tell you with everything that we'll go through, it's, um, you know, it, it may not make you the person uh, an expert, but I can assure you it will make you competitive if, if you listen and uh, look through the, the information that I'm giving, giving you and uh, you use it as a base mark to get started. Um, I'll tell you, you know, I've been involved with, with, with pigs a, a long time. And um, the thing that I do know, and I know this to be true, is I'm still learning. And um, to get to the point where I'm at, it's taken me ever bit of the 20, 25 years to get here. So I say that to you as you get started. And um, just know that, you know, it, it, it doesn't come easy, it doesn't come overnight. It just takes keep going back and uh, keep uh, keep doing it over and uh, learning from your mistakes is the big thing there. Learn from your mistakes and and try to do as much possible to eliminate those mistakes. And, um, you know, every feeding season is, is different and uh, there's a lot of things that will be repetitive 
But as you change animals, more than likely something about that animal or something about the feeding program will be different. Now, over a period of years, uh, things will start to become repetitive and you'll see some things. But just getting started off and, uh, and you know, we, we put hogs in the barn usually about twice a year. And, um, and just from, from one session to the next session, there's always something different. And weather plays a role with that, and as well as genetics and, and, and time frame and all of that plays a role in there. But um, just try and, you know, I'll, the other thing that I'll tell you uh, to help you out is take notes, you know. Um, you know, write weights down of where you are as you get started, and that'll that'll be references that you can go by on your next feeding season, uh, the amount of feed that you're feeding. And, you know, those kind of things can be, can give you references as you go through your, your next feeding season. So we'll get started. This is a, you know, I've done this presentation quite a bit and um, the slides on here are, um, I, I'm gonna try and go through it where we'll have enough time to uh, to actually have some questions afterwards. Just getting started, you know, and, and, and I, I began by telling you, you know, there's some things that you need to do, some groundwork before you ever even go get a pig, before you ever, uh, you know, go and pick one up or pick one out. And, and, and this is just, this can save you some, uh, some heartburn on the other end. Uh, you know, decide, you know, is this pig going to a county show is you going to a state show or is it, uh, you know, you're trying to decide on what age of pig that you want. Um, you know, there's a, there's a scale out there that I use and five and a half months to eight months is about where you need to be at. Uh, with six, six and a half months, in my opinion, is a safe mark. Today, with, with a lot of the genetics out there, some may say that's a little young, uh, I know that there's a lot of uh, seven-month-old pigs being shown. Uh, there's some eight-month-old pigs out there being shown, but you kind of got to know a little bit about the genetics in order to get into some of those older breeds. Uh, five and a half months is, is going to be kind of young. Um, there again, you need to know that something about the genetics to tell you if five and a half months is going to be too young for you uh, to push in order to get there. I've had some five and a half month old pigs that 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 grow out and be, you know, 260, 265 pounds. And I've had some some seven month old pigs that, you know, that that get up there around that two, 230 and and so forth. So you just kind of got to know a little bit about the the age of the uh, genetics, how the genetics grow in order to do that. But these things you need to figure out before you go to the show because by doing this, it allows you to um, know how you're going to feed this animal and, and, and where, you know, if, are you going to be pushing this animal the whole entire way or are you going to be coasting with him or are you going to be able to feed him at his best? And, and, and I can tell you the biggest thing that you need to know right now is being able to feed that animal at the right amount that it's asking for and his body's asking for can make you a whole lot more successful being when you're trying to hold one or you're trying to push one faster than you need to. And when I say push and hold, I'm talking about if you're having to hold one and restrict the amount of feed that you're giving one, then that's going to slow down their grow, their grow habits and, and you may not be able to put that bloom on him when you need to. If you go into this and you know that you're going to have to uh, hold on one or slow one down, then you might want to do some of that at the early part of the game because uh, at the end of the game, you want your pig to be as fresh as possible. Um, so, you know, knowing the show dates, how do you figure out, you know, am I, is my pig going to be too old or, or too young? So show dates is so, so very important. Um, you know, you can start calculating from the date of the show back to uh, the age of your pig. And, and that tells you right there where you're going to be at as far as uh, how you need to feed this animal and so forth. You can do that kind of calculation before you go to the breeder. You know, and, and I treat breeders kind of like, 
you know, a stranger. Uh, and when I say that, I mean, um, I want to know as much about this animal as I possibly can, rather than having to rely on that other person, uh, because breeders can be like car salesmen at times as well. And you need to know as much about this game as you possibly can of your own. So you can figure that out before you ever even get there. Weights, you know, weight limit, you know, that's going to go back to that that showtime and you know and 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 how old this animal needs to be. Uh, do I do I if, if my weight limit is 280 pounds or or if it's going to be 300 pounds or do I have a way back and you know all of those kind of things you need to know bef before you buy that animal because all of that's going to be dictated by the age of the animal that you get. Uh, more than likely, when you get your animal, it's probably going to be about uh, somewhere between six and eight weeks old. Uh, possibly, you know, well, I say that a lot of times when I pick them up, they're six to eight weeks old. You could be older than that, but on average, I'd say about eight weeks old is the time that 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 they're going to be when you start shopping and looking at them. If you look at them at their six months, you really got to know what you're looking at. Um, you know what you what the structure of them is, looks like in order to uh, go forward with that. At eight weeks old, they're kind of getting some bloom on them and they're starting to fill out and they're, you know, they're starting to have some muscle shape. So it's a safer time to look at them when they're about eight weeks old. If you're talking to a breeder and um, he says, well, when do you want to come or when are you trying to set up a time when you want to go and look at those animals, then certainly, you know, you, you can say somewhere around six to eight weeks old. If you don't have that good eye or if you're new at this, then then you might want to say six weeks old uh, because they'll be, you know, they'll have their feet underneath them a little bit better. Uh, hopefully those animals will be down on uh, chips or on a flat surface. They'll be off of the wire out of the crates where you can actually watch them travel and uh, and so forth. Some, some other things that we need to talk about, mainly if you're going to a show where the animals are, um, if they are, uh, if you show by breeds, or if you show by weights, and this can be really important, okay? And uh, I say this to say that, um, you know, I like to buy a good one, okay? Uh, color doesn't really matter to me. I, you know, if I'm when, I'm, when I go out shopping, I don't typically go out looking for a particular breed. Um, I do like the up-eared uh, hogs. Uh, I'm, I'm just, this is a personal thing. Um, I tend to stay away from the minor breeds just simply because um, I, I've i dealt with the uh, the major breeds a little bit more so. But all things hold true to you got to know if that animal is going to a classifying show or is they going to show by weight. So uh, that's something you need to figure out. Read your uh, your rules and your, you know, your, your, your guidelines for the show that you're going to and figure that out. So uh, you know, just because he's black and white doesn't mean that he's a hound. There's guidelines that says if this animal will classify, and, and those are some things that, that you need to figure out before you pick that animal up. Up-eared hogs versus down-eared hogs. You know, if you're going to a, a weight show, then obviously, in my opinion, um, the erect-eared animals are going to be a little bit more competitive than the down-eared animals. If you know, and, and not to take anything away from the uh, the down-eared animals or the minor breeds, should I be saying, uh, it, you know, it just takes a really good one. And, and some of those breeds are not far enough along to be as competitive as some of these uh, more popular breeds. We've spent more time with them, uh, with Hyper Vigorous and so forth, to try and get that uh, that animal to look the way we want them to. So just have you know, do a little homework on that part as you um, get ready to go out and select your animal. Talking about, you know, selecting that animal and, and, and where, uh, what, 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 what do I need to be looking at? And, and this is kind of an old cliche, but it's one that still holds true today is I like to study them from the ground up. You know, I'm looking at more about their feet and legs than I am about how much muscle they have. Muscle is is really irrelevant to me at this time. I mean, because as I said earlier, we're talking we're talking about an animal that's only uh, six to eight weeks old. So 
a lot of that bloom may or may not be there yet, but I want to see evidence of it, but I'm more apt to uh, be looking at uh, how this animal travel and what kind of structure it has. Is it going to be real uh, tight structured? Is it going to be loose structured? And obviously I'm looking for the animal uh, that's going to be looser structured because I can do more with that animal. Uh, that animal is going to have more longevity in him uh, if they're if they're in a looser structured manner. Um, feet and, and toes, I don't like to uh, pick animals up off the wire. Uh, and when I say off the wire, I'm talking about on a crate. Um, I like them to uh, be down either on chips or on concrete and uh, where I can actually watch their feet, watch the, the direction that their feet are going, where they're putting those at those feet down, which which direction are their toes going, how they're pointed and so forth. I want to be looking at those legs and see where those legs are going. And because in evident, the, the, the body's going to travel the way that the, the feet are going. OK, so if um, if they're turning out, then obviously then those knees are going to go that direction and and then you're going to get into some structural issues there if they're turned in and so forth. So sp spend a little time looking at that. That's so important to spend more time looking at the structure of the animal versus how much muscle that animal has. Um, this is just a, you know, uh, some slides here of some pigs, to, you know, just kind of give you an idea. Um, the first slide over there, looking at the chest floor of that animal. Obviously, you know, you want one that has that big forearm in him, uh, those knees going straight to the ground. Um, you know, there is a outside of the box that you can get into where that becomes too big, but, but obviously I'm looking for one that does have uh, some evidence of some width in between those front legs and, and have uh, some pec muscles that, that's going to show that, that forearm in him that, that says that he's going to have uh, some heart to him, uh, some heart girth to him as he gets older. Looking at that tail head, I mean, this is, this is another key point here. Um, I'm trying to elevate that hip and get that hip as level as I possibly can uh, because if that tail is sitting too low or gets down lower into the body, going down to, they tend to get steeper rump, as I call them, uh, get round out of their hip. Uh, they'll tend to carry their feet a little further underneath them. I like for that tail head to be level because that gives them a level design as uh, they start to profile later on. Uh, looking at those knees from behind, I want those knees to be straight from behind. I don't like to see them knead in or knead out. Uh, if you see any, any bow in there at this point in time, then obviously that you've you've gotten yourself into a problem there, and those are the kind of things that you want to avoid. Uh, belly and ribs is uh, is is so critical here. You know, uh, those animals should. I don't. I mean, I don't like to buy a whole lot of animals at sales uh, because I don't know their natural stage. Um, I don't know how much fitting has been done on them. I like to buy them off the farm. Um, because then they're in a natural environment and I can see how much natural belly and natural rib shape they have because that is so important to have that rib shape and that natural belly to them because that's going to promote uh, uh, eating habits as well as how they look later on. Length of body, obviously, you know, we want these animals to be long top and long uh, from the end to end or not to get too compact. Uh, I like them to be elevated at the shoulder. Um, I also like them to, uh, to to show some growth, grow some, have some performance. There was, you know, probably uh, about six or eight years ago, you know, we had a real moderate kind of a hulk. Uh, today time, you know, we're starting to get out of that. They don't need to uh, be too skelly but they do need to have some growth pattern where they look like they're going to be elevated up off the ground. And that is uh, very important. Um, talking about feeding and, and you know, uh, what kind of feeds are out there and where we need to be at. The most important thing that I see here that we need to be in concern with is water. Uh, they need to have access to clean water, fresh water all the time, not once a day, not twice a day, but all the time, especially if you're feeding hogs through the summer. Uh, cool, fresh water is so important to to that growth pattern. Um, if you, you know, if you're feeding uh, hogs where you have uh, 
one of those barrels or canister that you know the water comes out of. You need to make sure that that's shaded where, where that water is cool. Hopefully you have access to uh, automatic waters and and uh, they can have water you know at their, their leisure and it's cool and it's fresh to them. Uh, feed, you know, when you start thinking about feeding, uh, there's for the for beginners or, or even, I mean, the most important thing on a feed sack is obviously the protein, lysine, and fat. Those are the things that, that, that we need to be concerned with. And we'll talk some more about that protein level and fat levels in a little bit. Uh, fiber, I like to feed oats, uh, uh, beet pulp. Those are two uh, fiber uh, choices that I use. I think it helps that gut. It keeps that gut in a uh, working mode and um, don't let that animal gives us some roughage inside of his gut in order to keep keep that gut working right, as I like to say. <clears throat> back to, you know, this goes back to um, the water availability to them. And uh, I like these bowl waters. They tend to, uh, it's fresh water coming out of there all the time, obviously, you know, you need to watch those things and, and make sure that, you know, that they're not stopped up or anything. But uh, the other thing that they do is they save on your shavings. Um, during the summertime, pigs will, will learn habits of pulling on those nipples and making them a cool spot. And that's OK. It gives them comfort, but but it also creates a, a, a need for more shavings and, and shavings can be expensive. So I just like these bowl waters. I think they're neater. I think they're cleaner and provide uh, a good opportunity for that animal to get some fresh water. Uh, here's another one that I think a lot of people uh, get in trouble with uh, is weighing your animal on a, on a regular basis. Uh, you, can't, you can't do this too much. And if you don't have access to scales, then that's something that you need to start thinking about the day you pick your animal up. Um, because, you know, talking about what we talked about earlier, you know, I, I'm not telling you that you need to go out and buy a set of scales, but if you're in this game for the long haul and you, this is something that you're going to be doing from year in, or if you're young in this game, then um, then a set of scales can be a good investment because having access to them when you want them in, is is so important. But if you don't, that's okay, and you know just work with your ag teacher or county agent or somebody volunteers or a friend. Uh, somebody that can, you know, that's going to have access to scales where you can weigh your animal because that becomes so important. Weighing them on a regular basis, I mean, uh, pick a day out, whether it's a Sunday afternoon or a Saturday morning, uh, you know, Monday morning, whatever it is, and weigh on that regular basis. And as that pig gets older, obviously you're going to be more uh, weighing, doing a whole lot more weighing later on. But I, when you bring that pig in, obviously you don't need to be weighing him when he's 35, 40 pounds, but when they start hitting about 100 to 100 and a quarter, 150, you need to start knowing how am I going? Is this animal going to grow fast or do I, is, is he going to, you know, what kind of growth pattern is he going to show? So uh, I like to weigh on the AM weight, uh, uh, weight because during the summertime, you know, pigs can tote up on water and and um, you know, and give you a false reading. So I like to weigh in the morning time, and that kind of gives me a little bit more accurate uh, weight. Going back to that protein, obviously, when the higher the protein when they're younger, and uh, to get them started, I mean, they need that in order to grow. Um, you know, when they pigs come in, typically they're on probably on about a twenty percent protein, and that's that's pretty normal. And you can leave them there depending on their, their growth pattern, you know, and you're watching, you know, how their muscle is shaping. If they're starting to ball up and, and, and get, you know, real uh, juicy looking, then, then you might want to start thinking about slowing them down. And usually all of that starts happening when they get to be about 100 pounds. And, um, you know, so there's some, there's some guidelines there, you know, where you can kind of uh, see there where you need to be at as they go out. Now this is not this is not the uh, the uh, this is just a scale because I've had pigs you know that I brought them in and um, you know and they didn't last long on the 20 percent and they were on an 18 percent for a short minute and then they probably got on a 16 and they may have remained on a 16 all the way through. It just depends on the muscle development. 
Um, some that I've had on a higher protein and, and they've stayed there a longer period of time. Just really depends on how that muscle is developing. And you can watch that is also watch their stride, how their uh, how their move, how their movement is. If they start to get a little tight and starting to get, you know, restricted in their movement, then you probably want to start lowering the protein in order to uh, loosen them up and not let them get too muscle bound. Uh, you know, people always ask me what's the best feed out there. I tell them the one that you can get on a regular basis that's going to be fresh. Um, and, and by saying that, then I mean, um, you know, basically I think there's three feeds out there. Um, you can probably guess what three of those are. I think they're very competitive in those three feeds, but uh, they're not the only ones out there. But I just feel like there's probably been more time spent developing those pigs in order to get them uh, development out of those pigs with those three feeds. So fiber is so important to go along with that feed. I mean, that's uh, something that we talked about that beet pulp or either uh, oat groats, and that's not horse oats or race horse oats. That is oat groats. So uh, know the difference there. And it's a crimped oat groats. It's like oatmeal. And uh, that just, I'd start them off real light with that. And I'm talking, you know, dabbling them with just a handful and as I, they get older, I'll start increasing that. Fat supplements tend to don't come in till later. Uh, there's usually, depending on which feed you're on, there's enough fat inside the sack in order to keep them going. But as they get older, and um, if depending on what feed you're feeding, you know, fat supplement can be altered uh, later as if you have to incorporate some as well. How much do I need to feed, you know? Um, Typically, I feed pretty much free choice, and I use that term loosely, free choice, as we're going, because uh, when they come in, I want them to have as much as they want, but I don't want to, I mean, me personally, I don't own a self-feeder, okay? Uh, to me, that's a lazy way of doing it, and it creates bad habits. So um, I hand feed, but they're getting all they want. I put enough feed out in the morning that they can, uh, they can get what they want and it'll last them all day long and uh, but i it also gives me a, a a measuring spoon because i can see how much those animals are actually eating throughout the day if they're eating out of a self-feeder you know you really don't get to pay attention to how much they're eating and what kind of eating habits they have uh over a feeding period they're gonna average you know about a pound and a half you know so I think you saw a slide earlier that said that, you know, they'll feed about uh, 16 bags of feed throughout their, their uh, feeding period. But on average, you can say about a pound and a half of gain is their, going, is their conversion. So obviously when they come in at eight weeks, nine weeks old, they're not going to be gaining a pound and a half. Um, you know, they're, they're going to be gaining less than that, maybe a half, three quarters of a pound. It won't take them long. They'll get up to a pound a day. And they'll stay there for a period of time. And um, as they get up there, 150, 175, bumping 200, then they'll go to a pound and a half. And then they'll get on up there. When they get over 200 pounds, then they're going to be somewhere around two pounds a gain a day. Now, pigs can gain more than that. If their conversion are right and genetics are right, every, the opportunities are there for them, they can go on the, on the short end of the game. They can be, uh, they can gain two and a half pounds. I mean, that's not, that's not uncommon. So that's why those scales are so important. These are just references in order to help you along. How much, um, you know, as we're getting into that feeding period, <clears throat> um, I like to, as they get started feeding, okay, and here's the important part, um, is they're, is they're getting into habits. Eventually, I'll break them off of that uh, feed lasting all day long, okay? And that comes around when they're about 150 pounds, 100 and a quarter, um, 125 pounds. I want to start hand feeding then. And when I say that, I want to get into a habit of feeding twice a day. Um, this is where, you know, where I'm going to put out enough feed and it'll last until about uh, midday. And then they'll they'll have an opportunity to gain an appetite and then be ready to uh, feed again or eat again 
when I come in in the afternoon or when somebody comes back to feed in the afternoon. So this is where you start feeding twice a day. And yes, I'm, I'm recommending feeding twice a day. So I put enough out in the morning and um, they will consume that or have that. They don't have to eat it all up at once right then. Uh, like I said, it can last until about noonday or two o'clock, but I want them to be without long enough to gain an appetite. So when I come in the barn or, you know, whoever's feeding in the afternoon, uh, come in the barn, they'll be, come up, they'll be aggressive about wanting to eat because this is where the, uh, the habit starts to come in at. And um, when I walk in the barn, I want everybody to jump up because I'm looking around. I want to know who's feeling good, who's not feeling good, who's walking right, who's not walking right. So them jumping up, meeting me at the gate is something that's so important and uh, get out of those habits of what I call running and dumping out feet. Uh, that can, you can miss a lot of things like that. So uh, be aware of that. Be aware of habits forming as they start to eat. <clears throat> As we start talking about, you know, getting closer to showtime, uh, be under, you know, be very cautious. Be very cautious about what you're doing with your animals. And um, this is something, it's, it's just important. I mean, it doesn't have to be just because you're going to a major show. If you're going to a county show, it doesn't matter. You need to be cautious about what you're doing to your animal or the health that you're keeping your animal in. So obviously we want to be good stewards and uh, we want to do all we can to uh, be of good stewards to these animals. And sometimes, you know, that recalls, uh, you know, taking them to a vet or, or relying on antibiotics and so forth in order to keep them healthy, just like yourself. So medication is something that's important, you know, that's uh, that we have to be cautious of. If I walk in the barn, somebody's coughing, somebody's hacking, then obviously something's going on and I need to pay attention to that. Um, respiratory problems are so important nowadays in time because of uh, the, uh, the medications not being in the feeds like they were. So you have to be cautious of that. I'm suggesting that you get your relationship uh, with the local veterinarian, uh, preferably one that uh, that has uh, knowledge about pigs uh, because then, you know, there's there's antibiotics out there that they can recommend and, and uh, these respiratory problems are so common and it's so important that you be able to recognize that early on before you get into some lung issues and so forth because those can, those can create bad habits. Uh, obviously, you need to stay within the, uh, the time period, the withdrawal period going to any of these shows where there is a drug test uh, because you can you can surely get yourself in trouble and it's not always done intentionally most of the time with you know it's 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 going to be by accident and you just trying to be a good steward for that animal so just know what you're doing and like i said work with the vet somebody that's got some knowledge in order to keep you safe as far as uh, residues go with those animals this is another popular one that, that people ask me all the time, uh, you know, about feed and paline. How much paline? When do I start paline? Do they have to have paline? You know, this is one that I tell you, it's a individual animal uh, choice, okay? Um, I've had animals that I never even thought about putting on paline. And then there's others that, you know, I had to start them out early on and they had to have it for a longer period of time. But this is one where you have to have that key eye or somebody's looking at that animal on a regular basis because it's going to start some development there. And if you're not cautious of it, this is not something that you can read in a textbook. This is something that you need to have an eye for. Or somebody is seeing that animal, they'll be able to recognize when things start changing because if you don't, it can wind up in a train wreck. So just be cautious about feeding paline and know how it works and what it's going to do for my animal. Uh, I can tell you already, uh, this this summer is going to be a year of flies because of the moisture we have and warm days. If you know, I'm I mean, we just took pigs out of the barn and we're fixing to start loading them back up again, and we're already getting into fly season. And um, the best thing, the best defense against flies is just uh, good husbandry. OK, and when I say that, I mean changing those shavings out as much as possible. We don't change our shavings out every day. 
obviously that's you know that's kind of useless or, in, or very expensive should i say so we pick our pins every day we pick our pins every day and then you know we'll come in and start uh usually towards the end of the week by the time we get to the weekend we'll come in and we'll probably take out about half of the pin uh pigs are very habit forming is where they utilize the pin so uh we'll come in take about half of that out and then in about two weeks or t- therefore then at that time it's probably time to take the whole whole shavings out and change them out so uh cleanliness is is, is just the best way to fight off flies uh the next thing from that i mean there's every kind of fly spray out there it'll help it'll give you some knockback but it's not going to be as best it's not going to be as good as just keeping the animals clean keeping your environment clean, keeping your pens clean. All of that goes into having a better skin condition and, and as well as having less problems with flies. Ricky, we have, yes, a, we have a question on the text okay. chat. It says, um, when you buy a six to eight week old pig and you are starting to dump the feed to them and in the evening you can see what they ate. Yes. What happens if they dump the bowl out during the day? How do you just do you just refill the bowl again with the same amount? Or do you try to estimate what's on the ground? Right, right. That's a good question. You know, and um, and and pigs do that. I mean, they you know, they're very uh, they're like kids or puppies, you know, and they'll play around in their feed and so forth. And that goes back to what I was saying about paying attention to what's going on in the barn and what's going on. So to answer your question, if, you know, if I'm there in the barn and, and I see him knock the feed out, then, uh, and it's early in the day and uh, and, that, and, they're, and it's down in the shavings and obviously it's going to be uh, not of use to that animal, then yes, I'll go ahead and put some more feed out for him. Uh, but know this, okay, because that sounds like a habit that they're creating. And when when they do that, you know, uh, to me, that's a habit forming. And because I've dealt with them long enough, I know what's going on there. And that means that they they're really not hungry uh, or they you know, their appetite's not strong enough for them to uh, to go ahead and eat. You know, either they're, they don't like what they're eating or they're they don't they, they they're full and they're they're not at a point where they 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 have. Uh, they've already eaten too much. So don't worry about what they're eating, that they dumped it out. Concentrate on why they dumped it out. And when I say that, do they not like what I'm feeding them or are they eating too much? Because once I've gotten them to that twice a day feeding, there shouldn't be any dumping the feed out at that point. Uh, They should be more inclined to eating it all up and not, I mean, it's like a hungry kid. You know, he's not going to just dump his feet out because he's bored. If he's hungry, he's going to eat it. So pay more attention to the habit that's going on rather than uh, did they dump it out. Okay. Good question. Good. And the next question there is, um, what about um, for bedding? What about like play sand like you could get at a you know, hardware store or whatever? Is that an okay bedding material? It is, you know, uh, sand is is fine. Uh, now, the play sand, you know, and in, in, in that you get at a hardware store, or even uh, some people call it uh, 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 sandblasting sand. The only thing that I that I caution you about one, it's very coarse, okay? Uh, because we're trying to keep these animals as good hided, a good skin. We want that condition to be good on their skin, and sand can be very coarse. So be careful about that. The other thing is, uh, if I get it too deep, okay, those animals tend to bog down in it. Uh, it tends to make them pull more so when they're uh, walking in it. A good even amount, and I'm gonna say probably uh, four inches deep, you know, is a good where they got some uh, a bottom and still have some stability to get their feet up on top of the ground and they're not lugging in it, should I say. But the biggest thing to be cautious about is if it's too coarse of a sand, then it needs, you know, it can be very uh, coarse or very abrasive on their skin. So I would be more apt to uh, like a more of a uh, a river sand versus a, uh, a too loose of a, 
uh, uh, play sand. You can use that. You can use it. Just be cautious of the, the skin condition. Yes. Okay, great. I think that answers the questions we just got through the text chat. So okay. uh, you can continue on, sir. Thank you. Good deal. This is just another slide where I think we've kind of covered this talking about sanitation and, uh, you know, as far as people ask me all the time, what kind of livestock spray should I use? You know, I'm saying, you know, what's the best fly spray for, uh, for flies? The one that you feel comfortable with, okay? Uh, the one that you get some knockdown with. I use a permethrin. Um, I mean, anytime you go in my barn, uh, you're going to find a, a pump-up sprayer, a two-gallon pump-up sprayer, and usually I have, uh, you know, just a regular livestock permethrin-based uh, spray in it. And I'll take that and I'll spray over the pens. I'll spray in the hallways. You know, I'll spray the fences and and I'll do that, you know, once a day or every other day or something like that there. That's not solving my fly problem. That's just giving me a knockdown where I can actually, where the animals are very are actually comfortable and I'm comfortable being out there in the barn and I'm not getting invaded by flies. <laughs> This goes back to what I just talked about earlier. You know, uh, the surface that they're on tends to uh, advocate what kind of skin condition they want. And, and, and this is something that, you know, I hear this, this come up more and more today. And years ago, I never heard a judge talk about skin condition. But today time, I mean, when you're out there and it's uh, when you got a really competitive show, Skin condition can obviously make a, dish, a difference. So uh, skin condition can be very important. Obviously, shavings is going to be give you the best out on uh, having good skin condition. I'm not saying that you have to have a shaving, uh, a concrete pin. Um, I mean, I've seen kids raise champions on dirt, and dirt works just as well. Uh, but here it goes back to, to picking that pig out. If I know that I have a dirt pin at home, I'm not going out and buy a white pig, okay? Uh, here in East Texas, we have a lot of red sand, uh, red clay, should I say? So obviously, I'm not going out and buy a white pig for a kid that I know has a red dirt clay pen. Uh, at that kid's house, I want to buy a dark pig, or I want to buy a black pig, or a belted pig, something that's got a dark pigment to him, and uh, that way uh, he can clean him up and, and he'll look clean. A white pig on red uh, red clay is going to have a tint to him. I don't care how much uh, blue and shampoo you put on him. That skin is going to have a uh, tint to it. So just be cautious about that. That's just one of those things. Uh, obviously, I like to bathe them on a regular basis. Uh, it goes to what I'm saying. It makes that hide uh, more natural. It, it gives it uh, a more pliable skin. It, it, it keeps it more moisturized as well. Uh, I like to use a uh, skin conditioner in order to to keep it that way. And here's here's a note, okay? Excuse me. Um, during the winter time, when we have barrels on feed for the winter shows, um, that's the driest time. The humidity is the driest at that point. And the cleaner your pen is at that time is where you'll have most problems at if you're not cautious about keeping that skin moisturized. We tend to have very a lot of problems with lice in a dry period. Uh, and when I say dry, it may be cold, but the air is dry. And so during the cool months in, the, in, in your barn, if you got a concrete slab and you got a real clean pen and everything's real fresh, that's the pen that I have to watch the most because um, lice. Lice are, uh, will develop a mange on your pig. It tends to get into the tender parts underneath their flank area, up in their uh, underarms, on their legs. You'll see those little red dots. And uh, that's a mite mange, and uh, it can create a problem. So when I see that, it tells me that that skin is not getting enough moisture. That animal is not either getting bathed enough it's not, it doesn't have enough skin, uh, skin moisturizer in there because that skin gets dry and flaky. So if that skin is dry and flaky, you need to be putting a moisturizer on that animal. And when I say a moisturizer, there's lots of conditioners out there. 
Um, I use one called Sudden Impact or uh, Revive. Uh, those are real good skin conditioners to apply after I get through bathing those animals in order to keep that good skin condition. Blue and shampoo is obviously the best one out there uh, to keep that skin white and keep it clean. So uh, be cautious about that. Don't wait till the week before you get ready to go to the show to be the first time you give him a bath. Clipping these animals, um, this is can be, you know, lots of people out there and, and, and I give them credit and I give them uh, thumbs up for those people that can clip one without snouting him, uh, that's, I think that's talent, uh, really, uh, that shows patience. But that's probably the best way to clip one of these animals. I just don't have that kind of patience and I'm too uh, particular about getting it done correctly. So I tend to uh, snare mine. And by doing that, you know, you have to be careful and not let that animal stress out because it is very, very stressful on one of these animals to be tied off uh, with a snare. So be very careful there. Uh, talking about hair length and where we need to be at on hair, obviously those animals that have a darker height, uh, darker skin pigment, they can be clipped closer. Those that have a light pigment, like on Durox and on Hemp's, if they have a light pigment underneath of there, then you're gonna have to leave that hair a little bit longer on them, or they're gonna have to be exposed to some sun in order to get that pigment darker colored uh, in order if you're going to clip them close. Uh, if not, then leave that hair longer. I mean, we're, we're at a time and age where it's better for them to have long hair than to have short hair. Uh, you're not going to see one out there. I mean, I remember the day when we used to clip them uh, very close and, you know, a quarter of an inch or an eighth of an inch. And man, looking at those animals now, they look like something out of a uh, the space or something now. So don't clip them that close. I'm telling you, it's better to be safe than clip one, you know, a half inch or three quarters of an inch or something like that there. Uh, pig walks into the ring to me and they look more natural to me that way. Uh, they look odd when they walk in the ring and they've been scraped or they've been clipped, you know, less than a quarter of an inch. Uh, that's just too close there. Obviously, um, you know, you got to be careful of them getting sunburned if you do that as well. Uh, using good uh, moisturizer on these animals. I don't like to use these moisturizers on them, uh, oils or anything like it there when they're at the show because pigs, as you know, don't have uh, 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 pigment to breathe. Uh, they tend to get hot. They, you know, they, when those pigments get closed up with oil and heavy oil like that, it don't take them but a minute to get hot and they get started. Uh, they just don't have sweat glands is what I'm saying. And when you put that oil on them, they don't, they can't, their skin can't breathe. So it, it makes it hard on them. Getting them ready to show. This is something that where we get into showmanship. Uh, you know, obviously you got to get them out before you take them to the show. Uh, I like to get them out in the yard and uh, drive them around, move them around to the scales. All of this leads into training that animal uh, to show. So uh, some things that they need to be able to do. I need to be able to take him to the scales when I'm ready to skate, uh, to uh, get uh, get him weighed, uh, drinking out of a bucket. You know, when they get to the show, they're gonna have to drink out of a bucket or a pan or a pail or something. So it looks like a foreign object to them the first time you put it down in front of them. So I want to do that and do that, get them used to that at the house before they get to the show, and so it's not a foreign object to them. Loading them in the trailer. This is so important. Um, if they've never rode in a trailer, you've never loaded them on a trailer, don't wait till the day before show or wait uh, till you're on your way and you got a time you need to be at to be the first time you actually uh, go to load him on the trailer because the, pigs can be stubborn. And when I mean stubborn, they can be very stubborn. Um, so load them on a trailer and uh, get them used to that. Get them used to, to that. Know that they're going to um, they're probably going to um, have a shrink. Uh, you know, they're going to lose some weight on the trailer depending on how long a ride. The more often they ride on the trailer, the more comfortable they get, the more comfortable environment you put them on the trailer, whether it be bedding them on some shavings or straw or something like that. It's not too hot. They're getting some airflow. Then obviously that's going to take the stress off, off of them and they won't lose as much weight on the trailer ride 
if you're, you know, if you're going to one of these major shows and you got to be, these animals got to be on the trailer for a long period of time, you need to make that trailer ride as, as comfortable as possible so that they don't lose as much natural muscle and lose as much moisture out of them as they possibly. So pay a t close attention to that. Uh, don't create a great animal and then lose him on the way to the show. Uh, you know, this just goes into leading what I was talking about here. Uh, be careful if it's during the summertime. Uh, you know, I like to haul them at nighttime or early in the morning when it's cool. Um, I want them to, uh, they, can they can tolerate a whole lot more cold temperatures than they can hot. They just can't take the heat. I mean, if you got to haul during the summertime, and uh, then, man, I, I use shavings. I use water. I water those shavings down. I put ice in those shavings. Um, I use milk jugs, uh, Put uh, freeze them with water in them, give them something to play with just to keep that nose cool. But uh, most of the time, I'm, I'm, I got access to a fan or something like that there with some cool shavings in order to keep them uh, as comfortable as possible. You need to know how that trailer ride feels on them before you just lock them up in there and then haul off to a long ride for them because you can uh, you can get in trouble that way. Uh, you know, on show day, you be monitor your fluids and uh, know that uh, fluids are so important. I like to feed electrolytes and um, electrolytes are so important. You can't overdo it. Uh, uh, proper fill and shape is important at this at this time. I mean, uh, because they go into a stressful mode and if you're not giving them the right amount of shape and, uh, you know, you obviously you want to know something about what the judge likes. So, uh, fill them up to what, you know, what, what, where they look good. Uh, they don't have to have a belly drag in the ground, uh, but they don't need to be high flanked either. So find that happy medium and, and feeding, you know, fitting them out at the show is how you get to that point. Don't exhaust them once you get them at the show. Uh, you know, try and make everything as comfortable on these animals as possible at the show. Don't parade them around the barn and all of that because you're just wearing them down and taking a chance on them getting hurt or bruising a, a hawk or something like that there. So be very cautious about what you're doing once you get to the show. Monitor your weight. Goes back to that way back and so forth. So, you know, keep an eye on your weight. You know, obviously, um, if you got a way back, then know that they probably going to lose during the night if you got to overnight them and uh, you're going to have some room to, to feed in the morning. Uh, you know, that's you just got to be very cautious about what's going on to these animals. If it's hot, they're going to lose a whole lot more. And those electrolytes play so much more important uh, during that time period uh, when it's hot. And uh, just be very cautious about that when you start getting ready to go to the show. You know, showmanship is so important today in time. Um, it can be the difference between first and second. It can be the difference between getting picked or getting pinned or not getting pinned. Um, you know, uh, my oldest daughter, when she was showing it, you know, a heads up wasn't all that important back then. But today in time, as a judge, I'm telling you, you need to be able to drive your animal with their head elevated. Not to a point where they're not comfortable, or they don't look natural. Uh, it needs to be just elevated where they have a level look over the top of their back. You know, uh, getting their heads up too high can be a problem and restrict the way they move because as a judge, I like to see them, uh, see those back legs working. I like to see how well they can move. I'd rather them see them moving at a faster pace than just dinking along. So uh, being able to uh, drive your animal at a comfortable speed is, is so important. And how do you get that? And that's simply by working them at the house. Uh, you don't wait till you get to the show in order to work on showmanship. This is something that's got to be accomplished at the house. Don't wait till the last 30 days to get this accomplished. You need to start trying to drive these animals from the time you get them in. If your animal reaches 100 pounds and you haven't had them out the pen or you haven't started driving on them, then you're starting to get to a point where you're behind, in my opinion. Uh, obviously, the more you get them out at an earlier age and get them comfortable, don't just get them out and start, you know, whooping on them or running them up and down the hallways or across the pasture. Just get them out and let them be comfortable. Just let them root around. You don't need to get them out and get their heads up the first day, but just let them move around 
where they get comfortable being outside of their pen. And here's where most pigs become a problem. The problem pigs of driving are those that don't have that opportunity to get out as much. Uh, pigs are very territorial. And by them being very territorial, when they come out of their territory, when they get out of their environment, they're nervous. And they gonna flee or they gonna balk, one or the other. So the more you get them out, the more you move them around, put them in a different setting, in a different environment, the more comfortable they become being on the outside of their pen and the more relaxed they'll be for you to start driving. So the first time I start driving mine is just letting them uh, meander up and down the hallway. Uh, I may take a quirk and kind of move them around, uh, walk them over to the scales, attempt to get them on the scales, you know, those kind of things. Just letting them nose around and be nosy and, and get comfortable getting out of the pen. Once I got that relationship with them coming in and out of the pen, then uh, then it's time to start driving on them. And um, and then we can get into some habits of uh, moving them around, maybe wanting to get their heads up. And uh, just know that, uh, you know, the more the more I get them outside of that pen and move them around, the more comfortable they'll be. Uh, I, I need to know the best parts about my pig. I need to know, uh, you know, does he travel good? Does he look good from behind? Uh, does he look good up through his form? You know, does he uh, look good out on a profile? These are the things that I need to know about my pig before I get to the show. Uh, you know, driving them at a safe distance around the judge, uh, a good, comfortable pace is so important. Uh, not just dink, dink, dink one foot at a time, but a comfortable pace. Not too fast, a comfortable pace. And this is so important to getting that good look on that animal when they're out in the ring. Uh, know where you're going when you're out there. You know, know where, if you're at one of these big shows, don't wait and get him out of the pen and, and to figure out where the entrance gate is, you know. If you have a large county show, then you need to know where your interest is going to be at and have a plan, you know, um, have a plan. When I get to this gate, I'm going to make a 10 steps out and then go to the left. I'm going to uh, go 10 steps out and go to a profile. Know these kind of things before you go into the ring. Don't wait till you get out in the ring and then figure out, OK, now what do I do? Uh, you know, give your judge eye contact. Um, I'm one of those guys that. Um, I don't care about a smile, but I do want an eye contact because we can have a conversation just in us having good eye contact. If I'm eyeing you down, then that means I'm paying attention to you and you need to be on your game at that point in time. So, uh, you know, it's called the eye of the tiger. I mean, I don't, I'm not a judge that like a big smile. I, smiling is great for some judges, but for me, I want to know that you're in this game to win. And and that serious facial look is how I get that. So those are some things that are very important uh, at that point in time. Uh, you know, uh, don't let your pig get to the corners, you know, turning them before they get to the corners and, and being able to drive that animal out into the center of the ring, drive him away from the judge, drive him to the judge. You need to make four presentations to that judge while he's out there and, and, and you need to go to the judge, away from the judge on both sides. And, it, and the whole time you're doing this, you got your eyes on him and staring him down the whole entire time. Uh, you know, don't hit your pigs in the center of the back. I don't like to see you hit them on the butt of the uh, pig. I like to see, you know, you quirking from the belly and from the jowl. Uh, those are the more common places that we quirk them at. Uh, Keep them moving, you know, uh, if a judge comes in behind you, obviously he wants to see how the pig is traveling. So you want to keep him moving at a straight uh, line uh, in front of him and keep him at a good pace. So that goes back to if you, if you, you know, being able to drive that animal and be having an animal as trained, uh, you know, don't, don't use your, your, your quirk as a, as a weapon. Uh, you know, obviously for, if I'm, a, if I'm your judge, the last thing I want to see is you beating on your animal with your quirk because you're fixing to get, you know, a, a, a uncomfortable look from me because that's just not what we need to be doing. Use your hands to pull them out of the out of the corners. 
block, use your body to block them from going into a corner. Have that animal trained so you don't get into those kind of situations when you're out there in the ring. Uh, you know, turn your pigs before they get to the corners. We talked about that. Um, you know, know your best uh, habits out there. Need a tire is so important. Uh, you know, a brush or, or in your pocket, a rag or something like that is good in showmanship. Um, you know, know where you where you're gonna be at. I'm not a judge that asks questions, but there's lots of judges out there that uh, that do ask questions. And and for those kind of judges, you need to know ear notches. You know how much this animal eats, how much he weighs, what kind of conversions he has. These are all kinds of questions that a judge could possibly ask you uh, out there in the ring. So. You need to know these things coming into the gate when you're going out there for showmanship. Obviously, you need to know what he weighs, and those are the simple things you need to know. Know the best part about your animal. Um, know, you know where um, where 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 the best uh, the best light of that animal is. These are some things that you know. Just have a conversation. The more that judge sees you comfortable, and um, and you can talk to him and or her. In a comfortable state and manner, the more uh, the more attributes you're gonna get out of that judge. So, um, you know, <clears throat> again, I mean, showmanship is one of those things we've taken it to a whole nother level. Uh, showmanship we got from uh, showing horses. Horses were the first animals that we showed with any kind of style, and then from there it became cattle and everything else. Now with pigs, everybody's got their own. You got to find yours. I wouldn't say that one is better than the other one. I just say you need to find the one that fits you the best and that you're comfortable because as a judge, I'm looking for the kid out there that looks comfortable, the one that looks like he's got his game going his direction. I like to see, you know, there's a time when I think you need to bend down and give me that aggressive look uh, because at that point when I'm looking at you, you're trying to draw all attention on you. And I, and I say this quite often when I'm doing showmanship or in clinics, there's actually only two times you get my undivided attention. And that's when you're coming out of the gate, okay? Because at that point in time is when you need to give me everything you got because my attention is all on you at that point in time. And me as a judge, I'm gonna give it all back to you right there because I want you to di uh, uh, display your animal in its best light. Now, once you get past that point, you, my attention is undivided, is divided among all the other exhibitors out there. So at this point in time, you, you're trying to draw my attention to you. And at times, if you see me glance to you, then at that point, you want to do something to draw my attention to you, whether it's a light brush with your animal, whether it's a bend down and give me that serious eye of the tiger look, whether it's pick your head, your animal's head up, something to draw my attention to you and say, hey, here I am. I got the best animal in the ring right now. Give me your attention. Now, when I'm concentrating on somebody else, relax. And when I say relax, get into a natural stage, walk your pig comfortable until the light comes back on you and then you can shine again. Uh, showmanship is one of those things. It takes time. It takes going out in the ring. It takes getting the right animal to drive with for you. Uh, it's a partnership between you and that animal. And obviously, if that animal won't work for you, uh, then he's not going to help you win showmanship. So you need to take the animal in the ring that's going to help you win showmanship. Uh, you need to have a relationship with that animal where you know what's going to happen, okay? Uh, if you know this animal is going to run the fence, Obviously, that's not the one that you you want to take into showmanship. Uh, if you know he's going to run out of gas real quick, then that's not the one. <clears throat> it's not about how the animal looks. It's about how much longevity that animal has and how much of a show animal that animal can present for you out in the ring because you're trying to draw attention to you at this point in time. It has nothing to do with the confirmation of the animal. It's all about you presenting that animal to the judge. Uh, it's just, it, it takes practice after practice after practice in order to get this down. And as you mature and you keep going into the ring and you keep competing, eventually it becomes natural to you 
and you'll get your own light and then you can present that and then you'll have your um, your best light in the, in the show ring. Um, you know, there's a there's a saying that I, I, I snagged and I say, you know, you want to uh, if I can get it right here, um, you, you, you want to practice like you've never won and then you want to show like you're a champion. And what that means is when you're practicing, you practice hard and you give it everything you got. And so when you come into the ring, it looks natural and everything you're doing looks natural about what you're doing and looks comfortable. And that's what makes a good showman. So again, <clears throat> you know, this is uh, is one man's opinion and that right now is just my opinion. So I hope something I've said will uh, has been good enough for you that, um, it, you know, some attributes along the way that uh, help you on your next outing. Um, I wish you well, and and if I can ever be available to you or help you in any way, I'm always uh, I'm always there for you. And um, Brian, if you have any questions, I'll take those at this time. 